So what is it that you're tracking um, that will give you an indicator for somebody living with diabetes, type, either pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes? We what is it that you're tracking? Yeah, we're using fasting diet, you know, therapeutically, but we're also using it diagnostically because a lot of times you can tell by how the person's responding in fasting where they are in resol resolving their condition. So the, the parameters and the variables do vary depending on the patient. For example, a healthy person that's just coming in preventatively, which by the way, I think maybe who gets the most benefit of all from fasting or healthy people using it to maintain um, health. Normally we just fast until they're asymptomatic. It's usually a relatively short period of time, five to 10 days, and, uh, and then we move on. But let's say for example, a person has high blood pressure and they're starting off and their blood pressure is 240 over 120 and they're capped out on five medications. Well, ideally we wanna fast them long enough to get them to have normal blood pressure without the need for medication. And normal healthy blood pressure is probably closer to 90 over 60 than it is you know, 240 over 120. And that, that period of time may be from five to 40 days. And in some cases, we'll only be able to get them down so far, they may run out of reserves, we have to refeed them and then do it again. So it's not exactly um, possible to say with precision exactly what the ideal number of days of fasting is. We can guess pretty well when we review their history, their exam, their lab, we can get a pretty good idea. This person's probably going to have to fast three to four weeks to normalize their condition. And then if however long the fast is, they need half the length of recovery. So if a person fasts, for example, four weeks, we know we need a couple weeks of controlled refeeding because that refeeding is one of the most critical parts of fasting. Uh, too rapid a return to refeeding can result in problems, conditions like food shock or refeeding syndrome. It can be a, a serious business. So we, we definitely want to make sure that if we're going to undertake a fast, we have enough time to do it right. Yes, and I've heard that so many times in the past, how important the refeeding process is. People don't pay enough attention to that. Yes. Okay, so um, we educate our audience with diabetes about the power of intermittent fasting for weight loss, improve fasting blood glucose, and reduce cholesterol. Can you tell us the difference between intermittent fasting and prolonged fasting? Yes, now intermittent fasting has been popularized by Walter Longo and, and Mattson and others. And they talk about the fact that if you narrow the feeding window, so let's say you don't eat before a certain time in the morning or after a certain time at night, you can get a 12, 14, or 16 hour fast every day between dinner and then when you break your fast with breakfast, whatever time that happens to be. And they believe that, that even that short period of fasting will induce metabolic changes associated with uh, improving overall function. And cumulatively, that habit may be good. Now, it's possible that that's absolutely true, just as they described. The other possibility is that when you narrow the feeding window on people, you also tend to eat less overall. And if people eat less overall, they tend to get profound metabolic benefits. Uh, because let's face it, diabetes, hypertension, autoimmune diseases, many of these forms of cancer are conditions of dietary excess. So anything you do to get people to eat less excess is likely to result in metabolic improvement weight loss, et cetera. And it is true that narrowing the feed, feeding window uh, may help uh, some individuals uh, reduce their overconsumption of total calories, regardless of what specific diet they have to be following. Uh, in addition to the metabolic uh, changes that happen with short-term intermittent fasting, I have to say though, the data is not in yet, but I project and predict what we're gonna find is that prolonged fasting has a, ge a geometrically larger impact on some of these biomarkers than we will with intermittent fasting. And the reason I guess that is because I see, I use intermittent fasting with virtually everybody. Every, you know, we, we, we follow those practices with all of our patients, inpatients and outpatients, and we see benefit with that. But it pales in comparison to the profound changes you see quickly with long-term fasting. A three-week water fast, for example, can take all, you know, many months of carefully controlled feeding in order to induce the same biological changes. Yeah, so this brings up a good point here because a lot of our, you know, a lot of our clients and a lot of people who are living with diabetes, they don't have the time slash they maybe can't right. come in a true north. So sure. what can they do in the comfort of their own home? Is it just- Well, an remember, since the condition is dietary excess, getting rid of the dietary excess is going to be the key, whether they do a fast or not. It's controlling diet, sleep, and exercise. That's where the big payoff is going to be. If you can't do, get the benefits, say, of a long-term fast, or maybe it's not appropriate. Not everybody's a good candidate for long-term fasting anyway. You have to do it, you have to have a little more patience, you have to work harder at it. But if you can get the diet controlled, you get the exercise controlled, you get the sleep controlled, you get the condition controlled. It's just a question of time, how long it takes the body to make those changes. The one advantage to a medically supervised fasting is you can 
induce those changes quickly. People feel better and they're more willing to comply. But that doesn't mean they don't get to the same place if they're willing to be disciplined over a period of time and make the diet and lifestyle change. The problem though is many people, you can't even get them to eat the food for a day, even for a meal, because it's tasteless swill. They can't eat that whole natural foods because it doesn't have the salt, oil, and sugar that they're addicted to. They're caught in the dietary pleasure trap. And so when you fast them and then the good food tastes good, now they're willing to go along. So here's who I say needs to fast. If you can't do the diet and lifestyle changes because you're too much of an addict, Sometimes getting a little extra help is helpful. If you've done the diet and lifestyle changes, but it's not responding quickly enough, well, then that may be a way of facilitating. But the most important thing for everybody is to control what you put in your mouth, get the amount of sleep your body needs to heal, and engage in appropriate productive activity. Speaking of the people that would need a fast, what, let's talk a little bit about fasting at home. When, when is that safe? How do you do that safely? How long can somebody do that? So let's say for somebody living with pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, would that be safe? So I, I wouldn't recommend wa a prolonged water-only fasting without uh, having first a history exam and laboratory monitoring. Now, it is true that some people can do that if they have a cooperative physician. Um, you know, they can get the monitoring they need on a daily basis without necessarily being at a true health center. Uh, but what I would recommend at home is to take advantage of the intermittent fasting techniques uh, the reduced calorie techniques, and, and just eating the healthy diet. But if we're talking about prolonged water-only fasting, that's really best done under direct supervision of a doc that understands what's going on in an environment of complete rest. That doesn't really happen well at home typically. And that's where a lot of the things you hear about, the horror stories about fasting happen. It's not in a controlled setting. It's home. There's a lot of things that people could do at home. For example, you could uh, subscribe to a service that helped you do a home appendectomy and they could guide you through that on the internet. But the outcomes wouldn't be very good. You'd have complications and problems. I wouldn't recommend doing home appendectomies. I wouldn't recommend doing home prolonged water-only fasting, and particularly not for people that have complications like diabetes. You know, it, gets, it can get uh, uh, quite intense sometimes. So what about somebody who's living with type one diabetes who says, I wanna to come to True North and fast for the next two right. weeks? Or three well, weeks. we wouldn't do water-only fasting typically in true type 1 diabetics because you need insulin in order to be able to adapt to the fasting process itself. So type 1 diabetes, in other words, if your C peptide says you're not making insulin and you truly are a type 1, not a type 1 and a half diabetic, water only fasting probably would not be the approach that we would be taking with you. We'd be focusing on the diet, sleep, and exercise, getting that fine tuned in and being a little bit more patient. Um, you're, once those islet cells uh, are destroyed, it's unlikely that those are going to regenerate. Uh, under current, you know, approaches. And so uh, type 1 diabetes, we, we treat a lot of them, but we don't typically do prolonged water only fasting in those patients. Now, there are some people that are diagnosed as type 1 that aren't really type 1. They're actually making a little bit of insulin. And some of those people are the ones you read about online that say they overcame their type 1 diabetes with fasting, and now they're normal and off. And, and it is true, we've had some of those patients, but they're, they're almost certainly uh, not truly type 1 diabetics. They're, they're truly patients that still were making some, making some insulin and they're just very, very strict diets are allowing them to maintain normal sugar levels without exogenous support. Okay, so is the, is the, the danger then that fasting uh, somebody living with type 1 diabetes is that they still need some basal amount of insulin? Right. And, and, and in, insulin with no food. It's very difficult to keep them out of a hypo in right. a water with fasting state. And you can get into some really serious life-threatening complications with ketoacidosis. So again, um, we've probably done more of it than, than most people, uh, and it's not something that, that I would recommend. I have to say, of the few complications I've ever seen in my practice, um, most of them were in type 1 diabetics that we were trying to get heroic with. Got it. Okay. So let's talk about breaking a fast now. Suppose you've uh, you fasted somebody for two weeks, and they've seen a, number, right. like a significant improvement. How do you break right. Fast. So I think this is one of the most important and areas that where the most mistakes are made. You need to remember that you do a lot of mobilization of intermediary products of metabolism in fasting. So you're mobilizing a lot of junk from the cell that you really don't want inside the cells. But it takes a while to get that stuff out of the body. Most of it's eliminated actually in the urine as the blood is being processed by your kidneys. So even though you've mobilized a lot of stuff during fasting, you haven't necessarily eliminated everything yet. And those early days of refeeding a significant amount of detoxification is still taking place. And the theory is that if you go too rapid into that refeeding or do it inappropriately, you may 
undo some of the benefits that you've gotten by mobilizing materials by preventing them from being properly eliminated in the process. The way we do it at the Truth Health Center is for every week of fasting. Now, this is just as a general rule. Obviously, there's some individual variation depending on the patient's condition. But for every week of water-only fasting, there's usually a week of fresh juices. It's usually are vegetable-dominated, but also some fruit juices, if, uh, at least in non-diabetics. Um, and then there's a week of raw materials, usually vegetables uh, and or fruit. And then there's a day of uh, more concentrated, like steamed vegetables. So, for example, uh, the 14-day fast might have a day or two of juice, a day or two of raw foods, and then we'd introduce some steamed foods and then some starchy foods. It would take half the length of the fast to get them back to healthy, plant-based, SOS-free eating. So that 14-day fast would take about seven days of this progressive refeeding. Now, most people think they're going to be ravenously hungry and want to eat everything under the sun. That's not true if what you're eating is whole natural foods coming off the fast. Leptin levels are increased, normalized, appetite is actually... Uh, modulated, and most people find they feel full relatively simply, unless they poison themselves with a bunch of sugary processed crap. And then, of course, they set up the whole pleasure trap addictive cycle and get into binge eating and get into trouble. But when people actually break the fast properly, they're usually very satisfied. They don't feel hungry. They're not ravenous. They're not uh, feeling uh, deprived. They really enjoy their food. A lot of them are shocked because the, the chard tastes so salty. They think somebody added salt to the chard. Well, it tastes like it always tastes, but now they can actually taste it. Because one of the changes in fasting is neuroadaptation. So the tastes actually come alive. And now people go from thinking whole natural foods are tasteless swell to being something that they actually enjoy. And that's actually one of the big benefits of fasting is you can get people to the point where good foods actually taste good.